Um, so I got to ask you, you're a fighter, firefighter and you're deep in this thing. You mentioned all the while you're doing uh, plays and I'm assuming you're doing little uh, theater, wherever you can get it. When did acting truly become real? Because I, I, I want to, for our audience, people, people think, especially when they, they're locked into a job for a certain amount of time that this is it, this is all it's gonna ever be. I'm gonna do this and I'll retire and I'm gonna go off into the sunset. My life ends. You continue to dream, like, and, and, and it's bold of you, actually. When, at, at what point did you start getting serious about acting? And tell me about making that decision. I'm gonna retire, I'm not gonna do no more years. I'm gonna really pursue this acting thing full time yeah it was twofold i think one was you know i was dancing and the last big gig i did i was a correction officer at the time i used my vacation and i toured with gloria Gaynor. <laughs> i went with her to brazil Germany. Will, for everybody who don't know you should know that name i will survive yeah i went to london and then i was also dancing with another uh uh company called forces of nature i but i think i was dancing i loved it but I was getting to a point where it was like, you know, the, the, the thrill of it was starting to wear off. Or I did a, a, I did a dance piece called Shaka Zulu. Um, and we did another piece called La Cabeza at the Apollo. And it was about this great African uh, king and warrior. And something about playing that role and mixing theater with dance was appealing to me. Um, and I was like, hey, let me let me try this acting thing. And I remember the first thing I saw was Spike Lee was doing an audition for Clockers. So I go into this auditorium. Actually, they picked me. It was me, Makai Pfeiffer, this other brother from Harlem. Um, but I think I was too old for the role. So they gave me a little extra role. So if you look at Clockers, I'm, I'm in from the beginning. I've got a gold chain. I'm dead on the street. <laughs> that, so that was my first role. But then I was like, OK, let me start taking classes. and. First place I went to was a place called NEC, which was Negro Ensemble Theater Company. That's where Debbie Allen, Sam Jackson, Denzel, that's where all the legends went. So I went- But to, didn't, is, is that the same um, company that uh, Rock, Christopher, Chris Dutton? Is he out of that same? All of them, all the black actors in the 60s and 70s, that's where everybody went to get their chops. So Sydney, all of them. So that's where I went. They had like this three or four month intensive workshop. I took it. Um, Denzel Washington came to the graduation and, and the performance. Um, and that kind of, that was 1998. And I was like, okay, I like this, you know, let me build on this. So then I started doing like a lot of, I was in a comedy uh, theater company for a while. I was doing any and everything, you know, college plays. And um, 2004 or 2005, the cast, no, maybe 2003, the casting director says, hey, I want you to come be a reader for this movie, Notorious. They're doing a story of uh, Biggie Smalls. I was like, all right, I didn't know what a reader was. So I go in and a reader is someone who reads opposite everybody else auditioning for the role. So I'm like, damn, I'm not even gonna get to audition. I gotta read for people. So you gotta remember, this is after The Wire. So I see Jamie Hector coming in. Um, I'm seeing all of these Wire people coming in. I'm like, holy shit. And, <laughs> and I was, Jamie Hector blew me away with his audition. And I was like, I'm, I'm messing around. Like these people are serious and they hungry. And my firefighter check had kind of lulled me to sleep. And I was like, you know what? I got to turn this up a notch. So that's when I learned, I started looking at headshots. I started studying where people went to school, where they were taking classes. And I started going to all of these places to take classes and study. Um, because there was a point, and I remember somebody told me, and I was a firefighter, I was strap, had muscles, bulging, looked pretty good. So from that aspect, I was getting those type of pretty boy roles. But when it came down to emotional work, layers work, um, I was going in room and I was getting chewed up. I didn't even know how to compete because I didn't have the training. Um, so I had to humble myself. And then I was like, all right. And it's funny that you mentioned Charles Dutton, because I went to an intensive workshop with Tasha Smith. Um, Natasha Smith. So 
she had her, her guest, her special guest was Charles Dutton. So he gets up there and he speaks. And I asked Charles Dutton, I said, hey, look, man, you know, I got a son, I'm married, I got a mortgage, a house, um, I'm a firefighter, I can't go to LA at the time, that's where everybody was going, if you were serious. I was like, what do I do? Like, I, I wanna take this acting thing serious. And Charles Dutton said, hey, look, I'm not gonna lie to you, if you can go to college and immerse yourself in the arts, nothing's gonna beat that experience for four years. But he said, if you can't do that, he said, find a way to make it work. Take classes like this, take other classes, train with this person, train with that person. And that's what I started doing. Um, there's a woman by the Tasha Smith. I remember she said to me when I took a class, she was like, why are you not working more? Why are you not da da da? And I was like, she was like, you need to take classes with this person. And it was Susan Batson. So Susan Batson's an old school black woman coach. She does, she to this day, she still coaches Nicole Kidman. She, uh, I think she coached Puffy for, uh, was it Monster he was in? Monster. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I started taking classes with Susan Batson. And um, that's when all of the stuff that you mentioned about, you know, the effect that a mother has on you. So I was very good at expressing anger, being physical, rah, 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 rah. But Susan Batson broke me open with this whole type of emotional work where it was like, look, you got some baggage. And it was really the pain of my mother specifically um, that was really keeping me from, from, from uh, pr moving up the, the next step. And, and she used to say, your life problem is your acting problem. <laughs> so and my life problem was I was this arrogant, unemotional, on the surface type of dude. So I had, she cracked me way open. Um, and, but her classes were Monday nights from six at night to like four in the morning. Oh, wow. And I lost many girlfriends because for a year I was in that class religiously. And I don't think my girlfriends at the time understood. They were like, you're in an acting class from six to four. Like, come on now. Like, that don't make no sense. <laughs> but I was like, no, I, I, I even quit the job at fashion week because I was all, all the little jobs I had, I used to work for this antique show. I used to work at Fashion Week Security. All of those jobs, I quit. And people was mad. Girlfriends left me. But I was like, this is what I'm passionate about. This is what I'm doing. Sometimes I would get off at four in the morning, go straight to the firehouse, sleep and get up and go to work at eight, nine o'clock. And I did that for a year, but that was probably one of the biggest, um, the biggest things I, I gift that I could give to myself as far as just doing that emotional work and really taking my acting work to the next level. Um, so that, you know, it, that, that was late 2004, 2005. And then I started booking Law and Order. Then I just started seeing that the training was working, which even pushed me to get more training. So then I left Susan Batson. I went to another woman, Mary T. Boyer, who gave me the tools to, you know, just to really do stuff. For, it was, it, it just became really fun um but the the issue was even in the firehouse you know i'd get a call hey you got an audition tuesday and i would spend so much time getting off on tuesday to go to the audition but not really prepare for the audition um so i got teased a lot about oh you need it off you went to the audition you didn't get it blah 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 but i kept at it kept at it and then I booked a, a film with Reggie Bifewood, who's the husband of Gina Bifewood, who did Love and Basketball. I booked a film called Gun Hill, where I was opposite Lorenz Tate. Um, I went to Little Rock, Arkansas, did Raising in the Sun, which was another um, highlight in my life where I got to play Walter Lee, um, got my equity, got my union. Um, and it just slowly started to snowball and build. And I remember back in the days, people were like, oh, if you're serious, you need to go to LA, this, that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I can't leave my son. That's not going to happen. Can't leave my job. I've got responsibilities. Um, but I always used to tell myself, I'm going to do 20 years in this job. I'm going to book a show in here. And that's going to be it. And in my 17th year in the fire department, you know, I got an audition for Blacklist. It was on a Saturday in July. I was about to blow it off. I was like, nobody doing an audition in July and Saturday. But I went. Plus, there was no lines. But I went, did some improv. They called me back. I'm a very avid snowboarder. Um, I booked a trip to Chile. Um, they told me I booked the episode. 
I was like, okay, I, I can do it. But I think it was like August 8th, I was leaving for Chile. And then they said, oh, we need you for the next episode. And I remember like, damn, I'm gonna miss the first week of my Chile trip. And then <laughs> they was like, oh, we need you another episode. And I told my manager, I'm like, I just paid $3,500 for this Chile trip. Like, I can do this. And my manager is like, look, you're gonna be able to go to Chile another time. But I'm a person like, as much as I work hard, I like to play. And snowboarding is, is how I played. I was, that's life for me. So, um, I, you know, I went to Chile two years later, but Blacklist went from one episode to two, to a year, to another year. And then my third year, which also lined up with my 20th year in the fire department. Cause what most people don't know is even though I, I was on TV, I was still at the firehouse for two years. I was juggling both. Did the TV show Monday through Friday. I did like 40, 48 hours at the firehouse, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and then they gave me a six year contract with a little bit more money. It was hard because all my life I had been getting a paycheck every two weeks. At the same time, I had younger brothers who always hit me up for money and family mm -hmm. members, and a son. So it was a little scary leaving a paycheck every two weeks, but at the same time, I had prayed for this. I had dreamed for this. So I had to uh, kind of step out and, 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 and accept the blessing. And, and I, I retired from the fire department and went straight into full-time uh, the blacklist. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.